pages of Scripture in all of the Bible. I want to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, as, as we've mentioned already this morning, today is the conclusion of our fall uh, for the faith campaign. And our heart's desire is that God would have strengthened our faith in the Lord. We've emphasized a few important doctrinal truths over the last three weeks, and all of which are essential to our faith. Uh, we, are, we focused at the beginning of the month, we called it Word of God Weekend. And uh, we, uh, we looked at why we have the Word of God. Uh, you and I, we have God's Word in our own heart language. It is, in fact, the inspired and errant and fallible Word of God. And if we didn't have a Bible, what would we have? We would have nothing. The Word of God is essential to our faith. If there's any error in the Bible, you might as well throw it away. The Bible tells us that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. And all of God's word is inerrant. Last week, uh, we had one of my college professors come. How many of you enjoyed Brother Dalton? Just a different, different kind of sermon last Sunday morning and Sunday night. But we looked at uh, Baptist History Sunday, our Baptist heritage. And the greatest heritage you and I have as Baptists is doctrine. Our doctrine, why? Because our doctrine is stems purely from the Word of God. Amen. This morning, I'd like to focus our attention on something uh, that is all-encompassing, uh, something that is central to our church, the doctrine that is central uh, to our church. What is, what is our message? If you're able, I invite you to stand with me. I'd like to read here the first eight verses of Romans, I'm sorry, of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Notice what the Bible says beginning in verse number 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory, what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remaineth unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me as of one born out of due time. Father in heaven, we love you, and we thank you again for your word today. Father, as we've opened it, as we have read this passage of scripture, uh, Father, we ask that you would open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things from your law. Father, this is your word, and we would do well if we would take heed to it today. And so, Father, help us not just... Uh, be hearers of the word, but doers also. And so, Father, we pray that you'd give us great leadership in our hearts today as we search the scriptures, as we come to understand uh, the, the primary message, uh, the primary purpose of this local church. Father, may we all grasp this truth. May we all engage in this, in this activity, all for the glory and honor of our Savior. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. If you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, I'd like to draw your attention to what the Word of God says in the opening verse. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in verse, one, in verse number 1, Paul says, I declare unto you the gospel. The gospel is our message. Why did the Lord ordain the local church? Did you know that as a church, you and I, we are, we are simply the vehicle to the end. You and I are the conduit through which the word of God, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, is to be preached. In every one of the gospel records, as well as the book of Acts, we find uh, what the Bible, or what we term to be the Great Commission. For instance, would you hold your place here and turn with me, if you would please, to the book of Matthew. Matthew. 
Matthew chapter number 28, the final chapter, the gospel according to Matthew. The Lord has already died on the cross. He's already risen from the grave. And uh, as he prepares to ascend back to the right hand of his father, uh, where he is currently, he gives instruction to the church. And the Bible tells us in verse number 18 of Matthew chapter 28, it says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Jesus is God. He's the possessor of all power. The Bible tells us in Genesis 1-1, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. God spoke it into existence. But the Bible also says in John chapter 1 and verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. Made by whom? Made by the Word. Who's the Word? The Word is Jesus. For instance, if you hold your place here in Matthew and turn quickly to the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter number 1. The Bible tells us in verse number 15, who is the image of the invisible God. Again, this is speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the image of the invisible God. And he goes on, he says, the firstborn of every creature. For by him, verse number 16, Colossians 1, 16, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. You see, Jesus is the possessor of all power. He created everything from nothing. It wasn't uh, some big cloud of of gas hovering out somewhere in the universe that that ignited, that exploded, and caused life to, to be. That's not how it works. You know, there's never order from disorder. That's not how science works. God created. Jesus says, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Jesus is almighty God. He died for our sins. We'll look at this in a moment. Was buried, rose again from the grave, is alive forevermore. And he comes to the church and he says, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And look in verse back in, in Matthew chapter number 28, verse number 19. He then says, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. The Lord has given you and me a job. He's given us a work to accomplish. Our responsibility as born-again believers is to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to everyone in this city and everyone in this world. Look what the Bible says in Acts chapter number 1 and verse number 8. In Acts chapter number 1, Jesus again is just moments away from ascending back to heaven. And in his final instructions to the, to the church, to his apostles, he gives, he gives them this great commission. In Acts chapter number 1, in verse number 8, the Bible says, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Remember back in Matthew 1, or 28, uh, verse 18, he says, All power is given unto me. And the same power that, that God has, that Jesus possesses, he promises to give to his people. You see, you and I, we cannot live for God on our own. We cannot serve God on our own. We can't save a soul, but Christ can. And the Lord enables us by his power to serve him and to accomplish the work he's given us to do. And the Bible says, book there in Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8, it says, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Church, you and I, we have a mighty responsibility, do we not? Sometimes it can be rather daunting. Sometimes it can be rather intimidating. We often might question, well, how in the world can I ever accomplish this? Can this work be done? And may I say, yes, it may be done, 
according to the power of God in our lives. You and I, we have this message. We have the gospel. And the gospel is central to our church. This morning, I'd like to share with you three, uh, three truths about the gospel. The first is this, simply this, what the gospel is. You know, we live in a, in a day and age where the gospel is confused. You know, there are so many different forms of the gospel, but there's only one true gospel. You know, there are some who would preach a social gospel, some that would preach a prosperity gospel, but none of those are the true gospel. If they were true, then, then Paul would not have been sick. If, 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 the, if they would have been true, then, then Timothy would not have been instructed by Paul to drink a little wine for his stomach's sake. There would have been no infirmities. There would have been no illness. If it were true, then every one of us in this room today would be multimillionaires. Right? See, the, the prosperity gospel is a false gospel. Uh, the, the social gospel is a, is a false gospel, but there is a true gospel. And we find it right here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And this is the gospel that, that we preach. Because this is the gospel Christ commanded us to preach. Look what the Bible says again in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We, we, we find what the, the gospel comprises. Before we read, just want to remind you that the term gospel simply means good news. There is good news. Man, isn't that refreshing? Man, I just stopped watching the news altogether. Because there's nothing on there that I want to see or hear. There's no headline appealing enough for me to click on. Because at the end of the day, it's all just pitiful news, isn't it? But there's good news. And good news is found in God's word. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, look what the Bible says in verse number 3. He says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve, after that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. What is the gospel? Quite simply, if you, if you write things down, the gospel is this. The death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and that he was seen by the masses after his resurrection. All of this was done according to the scriptures. Did you know that Jesus is the fulfillment of God's word? Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of all God's promises. Christ died for us. The Bible says that he died for our sins. How that Christ died for our sins. According to the scriptures. And that he was buried. And that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Lord willing, in just a few months, we'll be able to take a, a trip uh, over to the Holy Land again. And my favorite place to go is where you see absolutely nothing. It's the best nothing you'll ever see. You walk down this old cobblestone path to a bus stop. True. True. And you look over this, this fenced wall and you see a bus stop. And behind the bus stop, there's a, there's a cliff. And in that cliff, if you look, you can discern the face of a skull. It's Golgotha, the place of the skull where Jesus Christ died on the cross. Well, just like the Bible describes in the Gospel according to John, in that same place, there's a garden. And remember the cobblestone path that we walked down that was in the midst of the garden. You walk through the garden to get to Golgotha. Well, you turn the corner and you go back, and, and along this the same cliff, there's, there's a cave. And inside that cave, there's nothing. You see, in that cave, someone used to own that cave. It was a man by the name of Joseph of Arimathea. Arimathea. 
When Jesus Christ was crucified, he, he loaned his tomb to Jesus. Joseph knew that Christ would only be there a short time anyway. Three days later, Jesus rose again from the dead. And as you walk into that tomb, that empty tomb, you see nothing. Because he's not there. And it's the greatest nothing you'll ever see. Jesus Christ is risen, as he said. He's risen in the fulfillment of prophecy. He's risen in fulfillment of of the word of God. He's risen because he died for our sins and the price he paid was accepted by God. And he rose again from the grave and he extends salvation to all who will come to him by faith. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's what the gospel is. That is the good news. Notice the second truth that we look to this morning. We understand why the gospel is important. Why is this gospel important? This gospel is important because this gospel is the only gospel that can save. You see, you and I have a problem. If you look back to the book of Romans, Romans chapter number 6, we find a dreadful problem that we have. You see... We all are sinners. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every one of us are sinners. We're born sinners. Back in in Romans 5 and in verse uh, number 12, the Bible says, Wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. You and I were sinners. Isaiah the prophet describes our sin as for being from the crown of our head to the sole of our feet. You and I, we are completely sinful. However, religion has deceived us. Uh, The false gospels have received us, or I'm sorry, deceived us into thinking that we're okay and that if we just are nice, if we just are good people, and may I say, we all ought to try to be good people. You know, don't go out here today and commit a crime, right? That, we don't condone that. Be lawful, good, salt of the earth people. But we have a problem, and that's a sin problem, don't we? You see, sin has a price that must be paid. What is the price that must be paid? It's found in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. The Bible says, For the wages of sin is death. You see, we have a debt that we can't pay. The price of sin is too expensive. Not one person in this world can afford to pay for their sin. The Bible says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Remember who Jesus is? He's the same one who died, was buried, and rose again. He's the creator God. He's the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He is the the fulfillment of all of God's promises. He is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. The Bible tells us that He alone is the only acceptable payment for our sin. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2, the Bible says, and He, speaking of Christ, is the propitiation for our sin, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. You see, what you and I could not do and that we are weak and unable, Christ did. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And he was buried and he rose again the third day. And this is the means of salvation. You see, if you and I, we, could, we can live our lives. We can can leave this place, forget all about this, but one day we'll stand before God. 
And only those who have received Jesus Christ as their Savior have salvation. You know what Jesus says? He that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. You know that God loves us? In spite of our sin, God loves us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Romans 5, 8 says, But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For whom did Christ die? He died for us. He died for me. He died for you. Who would do such a thing? You know, I really don't, don't take this the wrong way. But there's really, in life, there's only a handful of people that I would die for. And they all live under my roof. My wife, my children. You see, Christ, in spite of our wickedness, in spite of our sinfulness, did what we cannot do. If you look back in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, notice what the Bible tells us in verse number 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 21. The Bible says, For he hath made him to be sin for us. God the Father made Christ sin for us who knew no sin. Jesus did not know sin. Jesus is perfect. He's impeccable. He is sinless. He is spotless. He is the only one who possesses no sin and therefore is the only one able to pay for our sin. He made him to be sin for us. Jesus, when he was on the cross, became sin for us. He took all of our sin upon himself. I heard someone ask, well, was it our past sin, our present sin, or our future sin? Well, when Jesus died, it was all future sin, wasn't it? Because I wasn't alive yet. Christ died for all of my sin. Made him be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You and I, we can have salvation because of what Jesus Christ has done. You see, it's not about being a good person. It's not about doing good works or going to church, which is good, and you should. Right? It's about receiving Jesus Christ as Savior. This is why the gospel is so important. Look back to Romans chapter number 1. Romans chapter number 1. The Bible tells us, as Paul writes, he says, beginning there in verse number 16, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. This is the true gospel. This is the gospel that Paul preached. This is the gospel that the Lord has commissioned the church to preach. This is the gospel that we've read of in, in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. This gospel is the only gospel that can bring salvation to the lost man. And he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Only salvation in the gospel. You know what the gospel is and why it's important. But notice finally this morning how we should respond to the gospel. How should you and I respond to the gospel? What should be, what's, what's the best thing to do. We hear the gospel. We see our need. What, what are we supposed to do with it? You and I, we're supposed to receive it. I want you to look with me back to Acts chapter number 16. One, personally, one of my favorite stories in all the New Testament. Paul and Silas are in the city of Philippi, which is in modern day Greece. And as you arrive in the city, uh, they, God allows him to plant a church. Interestingly enough, there's, there was no synagogue for Paul to enter into on, on the Sabbath to preach. And so he goes and uh, he meets this lady named Lydia. She's a, a, a woman of, of great wealth. 
She's a, a business owner, an entrepreneur. She sold purple dye, which would be taken and, and given to, uh, to merchants, and they would make clothing out of it, dye clothing. A purple, of course, is a, the color of royalty. And so, I mean, she, she, was, she was doing pretty well. Paul and Silas met her down by the river. She was there praying and worshiping, and she, they led her, her to Christ. What, a, what a, an amazing story it was. And as they walked the streets of Philippi, there was a little slave girl that was possessed by a devil. And she was, she was a, a soothsayer, a fortune teller, and she would make her, her owner a lot of money. However, she followed Paul and Silas through the city, declaring that they, in fact, were preachers of the, of the true and living God, and that everyone should listen to what they had to say and receive Jesus Christ as Savior. Well, this went on for days. And finally, Paul and Silas had had enough. And so they turn around and they rebuke the devil and cast the devil out of this little girl. Well, her owners were unhappy because now they just suffered great financial loss because their great means of income is no longer able to perform the job that they'd given her to do. Enraged, her owners went to the city magistrates and they falsely imprisoned Paul and Silas. And we pick up the story, the Bible says in verse number 25 of Acts chapter 16, And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the, the doors were open, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep, And seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, What must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Friends, how should we respond to the gospel? Would we should respond as this jailer responded? Simply believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And be saved. The Bible says, Neither is there salvation in any other. For there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus tells us in John chapter 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Friends, Jesus is the only way. I heard a story several years ago about a man who lived during the 1920s. His name was John Griffith. John Griffith lived in in the state of Oklahoma, and he was a newly married man. And uh, God had blessed him and, and and his lovely wife with a little boy they named Greg. Well, in 1929, the the Great Depression struck. And the horrible effects of a financial strain spread across our nation. Well, John and his wife realized that they needed to do something. Where they were living in Oklahoma would not suffice, so they packed up all of their earthly possessions and they moved east toward the mighty Mississippi River. And as he arrived in Memphis, Tennessee, John found, he quickly found work as a drawbridge operator. And John's job was to, to stand watch uh, in this control room and, and, and raise and lower the drawbridge so that ships could navigate safely below and that trains could pass safely across. And John did pretty well. 
Uh, for years, John operated that bridge flawlessly. It was around the year 1937 that John had a, a, new, uh, a new ambition in life. And as his son, Greg, was now eight years old, and he thought, you know what my son needs to do? He needs to learn how to work and how to do this job. And so with great enthusiasm and excitement, they, the, the next morning they, they got up and they packed all of their lunch boxes. And, they, and John took Greg to work with him at the train bridge that would cross the mighty Mississippi River. And as they walked across that catwalk, and as they climbed that, that long, that tall ladder up into the control room, John was so excited to have his son there. And he was so eager to teach him all the intricacies about his job. And he says, son, with this, with this lever, I can, with the pull of this lever, I can, I can actuate these, these huge gears that will raise or lower the train track. And allow the ships to pass and the trains to pass. And man, full of glee, Greg looked there with great admiration and believed in his heart that his father was the greatest man to ever live. Well, before you know it, the hands on the clock struck noon. So John went over and he, he pulled that lever on that bridge. And those gears began to turn and that bridge began to lift. And all the scheduled ships passed safely below. And after they watched those ships sail past, they took their lunch and they went down and they began to eat lunch together. And, and as they would look out, they would see these, these big barges carrying their freight up and down the river. And, and John would tell stories about the, the beautiful destinations that these ships were sailing to and, and all the great adventures the sailors had to enjoy. And all of a sudden, they were awakened, brought back to reality by the sound of a whistle from a train blowing off in the distance. John took out his, stop, took out his watch and looked, and 107 was the time on the dial. John quickly rose up and looked at his son and said, Greg, I want you to stay here. I'll be right back. And John hurriedly got up and he ran down the catwalk, climbed that, that tall ladder and, and began to look up and down the river, making sure there were no oncoming ships that would, that would crash into the bridge. And and having a clear line of sight, he saw no ships. And as he was trained to do, he glanced down below him. And through the grating in the floor of that control room, he saw the worst thing he could have ever possibly imagined. You see, apparently Greg wanted to follow his father. And in his haste, he slipped and he fell off of that catwalk and he landed in between the two main gears of that drawbridge. He was stuck between the cogs of the gears. He was scared. He was crying. He was visibly hurt. His leg, his pant leg stained with blood. But off in the distance, the whistle still sounded. It was the Memphis Express a passenger train filled with 400 people strong. And that train was rushing down the tracks. John Griffith realized he only had moments to act. And he's trying with great frustration and great worry and angst to, to think, how can I save my child and yet lower the, br lower the bridge? He looked off in the corner and he saw a rope coiled. He thought, well, if I tie that rope off and put it around my waist, I can, I can swing down and, and, and get my son out of the gears. And, and maybe with enough time where I can climb that ladder, pull that lever, and lower the bridge back in time. He realized quickly that there was nothing he could do. 
He had a choice to make. His son, Greg, his only son, Greg, stuck helplessly. He knew if he could save his son, but if he did, all 400 passengers aboard the Memphis Express would die. He knew he could let that, that train cross the bridge, but if he did, his son would die. He only had moments to act. And bearing his face in his left arm, he reached over, pulled the lever, and those gears began to turn. The cries of his son were quickly overshadowed by the moving gears. The train rushed out of the trees, down the tracks, crossed the bridge, having been lowered just in the nick of time. With tear-soaked face, John Griffith looked up and he watched the train go by. Looking in the window of the passenger cars, he, he saw a businessman reading the morning newspaper. He saw the train conductor carelessly looking at the time on his stop on his on his vest watch. He looked in the dining cars and he saw the ladies enjoying their afternoon tea. He saw a little boy looked strangely like his own son taking a spoon and plunging it into a bowl of ice cream. Not one of them realized what had just done. Overwhelmed. John was beating on the glass. Do you not know what I just did? I just sacrificed my son for you. And as quickly as the train came, it was gone. You know, many of us, we live our lives so carelessly, don't we? You realize that there's, there's danger ahead of us. There is, there is a judgment. There is an eternity. There is a heaven. And there is a hell. What John did, though awful, pales in comparison to what Almighty God did for you and me. We live, we give no thought to Jesus Christ. But God sacrificed his own son so that you and I might be saved from the wrath that is to come. May we, with great thanks, live our lives accordingly. May we respond to the gospel in a manner that would glorify and honor Jesus Christ. You see, the Bible says that God would have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. That's God's will for all of us, but you and I, we all have to decide whether or not we will, in fact, receive Jesus Christ as our Savior. If you look back in Romans chapter number 10, the Word of God tells us how we ought to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
The Bible tells us, beginning in verse number 9 of Romans chapter number 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Look down in verse number 13. The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. In 1989, uh, January 7th, 1989, I realized that I was a sinner. And having been taken to church, faithfully taken to church as a child, I heard the gospel. One day I understood, however, that I was a sinner and that I needed to accept Jesus Christ as my Savior because He's the only way to have salvation. I believe that Jesus died for my sins, was buried, and rose again from the dead. I knew that there was no amount of good works that I could accomplish to get to heaven. And I simply asked the Lord to forgive my sin and be my Savior. And you know what happened? He did. So how do you know? The Bible tells me. It says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And may I say, that's the message we preach. This is what God has given us to do. To take the gospel to all men. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed.